Tonight we're looking at the theme of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is the third in our series. In our first night together on this theme, we examined the topic that the Spirit is a person. He is not something, therefore, that we get a hold of. He is not an it to be possessed, but he is someone who gets hold of us. We do not use him for our purposes, but he seeks to use us for his purposes. Last week, we looked together at the work of the Holy Spirit, many-sided, many-faceted in dimension. Prior to our becoming a believer, the Spirit was active in our life in bringing us to an awakened sense of sin, bringing us to affirm the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and bringing us to an awareness of judgment against the evil one already handed down. We found that in conversion we are regenerated, born anew through the work of the Spirit, and that the Spirit indwells all of us who are Christ's people, and the Spirit leads us into the truth of God and is always assuring us that we are God's children. When we approach the theme of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we immediately face in the body of Christ several different views. There are three in particular. One is the view that the baptism in the Holy Spirit and that terminology which is used in Scripture is meant to be taken as synonymous with conversion, that when we give our life to the Lord, we are automatically baptized in the Spirit, that therefore the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 represents the moment the early church became Christians. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, therefore, is not something that is meant to be repeated in the lives of believers today in the kind of way that is described in Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9, Acts 10, and Acts 19, but is instead to be seen as God's way of giving the church a giant cosmic shove-off into the centuries that it would exist that the church all at once was born in a TNT of the power of the Holy Spirit and it has been operating off that sunburst of energy of the Spirit of God since its inception. On the opposite extreme are those within the Pentecostal church who have perhaps not explicitly but sometimes implicitly taught that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the highest goal of Christian experience and once you have received it, you can relax. Unfortunately, that is the childhood and teenage view I had of the baptism in the Spirit. In my particular church, you couldn't hold office in the youth group unless you had been baptized in the Spirit, and I couldn't figure out why the Holy Spirit kept passing me over. And it was to me the highest goal of my life, and when I received it, I promptly relaxed. Until years later, when the Spirit showed me what the real function of the baptism in the Spirit is, and that I think is the third view, that the baptism in the Spirit is part of our initiation into the Christian life and that there are several events described in Scripture as initiation events into the Christian life, namely salvation, water baptism, and the baptism in the Spirit. Sometimes there is a separation of time between salvation and water baptism, and sometimes there is a separation of time between salvation and the baptism in the Spirit. But I believe in the ultimate intentionality of the Lord, it is His purpose to make this a cluster of initiation events into the Christian life. Those who believe this third dimension of truth about the baptism in the Spirit, that it is part of our initiation of the Christian life, are called Pentecostal or charismatic. As I grow older, I am more and more favoring the term Pentecostal, primarily because it seems to me it is a more biblical word to describe the experience, whereas charismatic is not used in the book of Acts and is generally a word to refer to all spiritual gifts, the charisma in general. The focus of the baptism in the Spirit is twofold. Its focus is deepening our worship of the Lord through giving us a language of praise which we have not learned, that is, speaking with other tongues, and its second purpose is to give us power in our Christian witness. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, therefore, is a crisis experience, even as salvation. We do not receive salvation by osmosis or degrees, 
but it comes as an event in time to us. Mainly as I approach tonight the theme, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as we have done on previous nights and will do so in nights ahead, I choose in my presentation to be primarily doctrinal and biblical rather than anecdotal. I don't plan on telling a lot of stories. Many of us who grew up in the Pentecostal movement came to experience the baptism in the Spirit through motivational stories, and I thank the Lord for them. And many times we had an experience with the Lord that we could not at the moment thoroughly defend from Scripture. And when I was in seminary, I used to be troubled by the fact that my colleagues would sometimes tell me that the trouble with you Pentecostals is you have an experience and you go hunting then in the Bible to see if it substantiates your experience. And it dawned on me one day in reading the book of Acts that Peter did exactly that same thing in Acts chapter 10. He had an experience of a sheet descending from heaven and a voice saying to him, eat. And he said, no, Lord, I can't eat. And then finally the experience was so overwhelming that he, that he was agreeable to doing that. And the Spirit used that as the bridge moment to bring Cornelius to Peter's presence and Peter into Cornelius' presence. And later it would be Peter who would understand from Mark chapter 7 that the Lord during his earthly teaching had declared all foods were clean. But he would have never acted upon the teaching if he hadn't had the experience. I have no objection with a person having an experience with God before they fully understand it, as long as that experience is ultimately backed up by God's Word. And if the experience is not backed up by God's Word, then by all means we either need to redefine the experience we have had or repudiate it. That's why I absolutely have no time for those who promulgate a doctrine that we can have an experience as Christians of being possessed of an evil spirit. So I find absolutely not a shred of scriptural evidence for it. And my heart cannot go where the scriptures don't go because God's word and God's spirit always agree. And in spite of someone's experience, I have to keep saying, I've got to redefine your experience before I will redefine the scripture. But when there is evidence for the baptism in the Spirit, then we need to take that and deal with it seriously. After we've had an experience, we test its validity. And I think in the Pentecostal movement, sometimes many young people have been argued out of a legitimate experience they've had with God because they did not have sufficient grasp of what the scriptures said. So as we look tonight at the theme, the baptism in the Spirit, I want to use five scriptural terms that are used of the baptism in the Spirit. The first term is the baptism in the Spirit, and in your notes it appears that I have misspelled in. What I have actually done is give the Greek preposition, en. Anyone who's translated a language knows that prepositions are the most difficult to use in any language. In English, for example, we have separate prepositions to describe the prepositions in and by, by. But for the Greeks, the preposition en, en, could refer to both, either in or by or with. The term baptism in the spirit, en, occurs twice in the book of Acts, both times on the lips of Jesus. Acts 1.5, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Acts 11:16, where Peter says after the baptism and baptism in the spirit of Cornelius, then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think it's very vital to note the sequence of how this term is used in Acts for it is used on the Lord's lips after the experience of John chapter 20, verse 22. And we took some time last week to deal with that, where on the first evening of his resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples behind closed doors and breathes upon them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
And we have located that as the moment that the fruit of Christ's victory in the cross and in the resurrection were made applicable to the disciples, that up to that time, their faith had only been the faith of every Old Testament person, a faith that anticipated what God would someday do. Now all the benefits that could be won by Christ have been won, and his eternal life is now through the Spirit breathed into the disciples, and God is making them eternal living beings. Therefore, it is appropriate to say at that moment, as it is always appropriate to say of every Christian, when we have received Christ, we have received the Spirit. The Pentecostal message is grossly misunderstood if anyone assumes that someone who has not received the baptism in the Spirit has not received the Spirit in conversion. We all receive the Spirit of God in conversion. No one can even call Christ Lord except by the Spirit. And when I became a Christian, and when you became a Christian, we didn't become a two-thirds Christian, having the Father's presence and the Son's presence, but we had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, when Jesus talks in Acts 1-5, and when he is quoted in Acts 11-16, he is still speaking about the Holy Spirit's work. But he has to be speaking about it in a different context than that of John 20, 22, since he is talking to the same people that were in the room who had already received the Spirit. And he is saying to them, in a few days, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There seems to be some confusion among this in Christian circles, especially when we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and find the phrase, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we we're all given the one spirit to drink. And there are those who look at this passage and say, well, here it is, plain as the nose on your face. All Christians have been baptized by the spirit. And therefore, the idea of a separate work of God called the baptism in the Spirit subsequent to conversion is not a scriptural teaching because 1 Corinthians 12 says that all have been baptized by one Spirit. However, this particular view has two problems with it. One is that it fails to understand the difference between the Holy Spirit's work in John 20:22 20, and that promised by Jesus in Acts 1:5, and it also fails to understand the different ways in which the Holy Spirit is at work. It may hang upon partly an understanding of a preposition. Because the preposition in can mean with or by means of, or it can simply mean in. We are either baptized by the Spirit or we are baptized in the Spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that by the Spirit we were all baptized into Christ. And Jesus says, on the other hand, that we are to be baptized in the Spirit. Can it be that the same preposition has two different meanings? Let me suggest to you that it does. For example, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Same preposition. In other words, John is saying, the same way I baptize you in water will be the way he baptizes you in the Spirit. How did John baptize? Did he baptize by means of water or in the water? If he baptized by means of water, it simply meant he took some water and placed it upon the candidate. If he baptized in the water, it meant that he submerged the person in the water. Well, we know kind of from the scripture how John baptized because Matthew 3.16 tells us Jesus went up out of the water, which meant if the preposition out is used, that he was in it. John 3.23 says that John was baptizing in a certain place because many waters were there. And if he was not baptizing in water, he didn't need much water. So the fact that he was baptizing where there was much water was showing that he was putting people in the water. Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, 38 to 39, both went into the water and came up out of it. Therefore, water baptism means to be baptized in, not simply baptized by means of water, but baptized in it. Baptism itself in the Greek language meant to immerse. The Greeks used it in reference to the sinking of ships. They were submerged in the water. They used it of crowds overwhelming a city. They used it metaphorically of being drowned in drink. Therefore, the baptism in the Spirit means to be immersed, to be sunk, to be overwhelmed in the environment or the person of the Spirit. 
John baptized in water. Jesus baptizes in the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, however, the element into which we are baptized is not the Spirit, but the body, the body of Christ. By one Spirit, you were all baptized into one body. Now, the reason why we assume very clearly that, John, that Paul is using the preposition by for the Greek preposition in is that wherever he uses the preposition of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 consistently, it is always a means of something happening, not a, what is called a locative preposition. That gets technical. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God and it would not be right to translate that no one speaking in the Spirit of God, but speaking by the Spirit of God, says Jesus be cursed. 1 Corinthians 12, 9, to another faith by the, by, not in the same Spirit, but by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Therefore, what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that by the means of the Spirit in conversion, we are placed into the body of Christ. And what Jesus is saying in Acts chapter 1, 5 is that he is the one who baptizes us in the Spirit. Perhaps a way of putting this all together is to know and understand that there are several baptisms that the New Testament addresses. In fact, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 specifically says that one of the elementary aspects of Christian doctrine is teaching regarding baptisms. And the baptism is in the plural, meaning the early Christians, the biblical Christians, knew that there was more than one baptism. So plural is used. There are essentially three baptisms in the scripture. There is water baptism. There is the baptism into the body of Christ by the Spirit, which is conversion. And there is the baptism in the Spirit, which is the Pentecostal experience. The difference between them is this. In water baptism, the agent of the baptism is the minister. Pastor Tesh this evening was the agent of the baptism who placed the candidate into an element. And the element into which the candidate was placed was water. And the time of that person's placement into the water was following their conversion. Conversion, then baptism. In when we are converted, the agent of the conversion is the spirit who places us into the element, the body of Christ, and the time is conversion. In the Pentecostal experience of Acts chapter 2, the agent of the conversion is not the minister or not the spirit, but Christ, who is the baptizer. The element into which we are placed is the spirit, and that occurs either alongside with conversion or after conversion. Therefore, in conversion, the spirit acts as the agent, ushering us into the life of Christ. And in the baptism in the Spirit, Jesus is the agent who ushers us into the dimension of the fullness of the Spirit. In fact, the experience of the Spirit with Jesus is a model for our own experience with the Spirit. He was conceived by the Spirit, and yet at his baptism, the Spirit came upon him as a dove. The fact that he was conceived of the Spirit meant that all through his existence, the Spirit resided in him. And yet, as he begins his earthly ministry, the Spirit comes upon him. The fact that the Spirit came upon him did not mean that up to that time the Spirit was absent from him. It meant now that his public ministry had begun and he had a need for an empowerment of the Spirit in his ministry. That's why after the temptation he's able to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit had always been in him. But at his baptism there was this crisis experience of the Spirit coming upon him. Now the church models that of the Lord. We are conceived by the Spirit. The life of Jesus is born into us, born of the Spirit. Therefore, everyone who has Jesus has the Spirit living in him or her. But there is a subsequent work that we find in Acts chapter 2 where the church or where individual Christians get ready to assume their spiritual responsibilities and work. And for that, we need the Spirit to come upon us. We need to be placed into the Spirit even as the Spirit has placed us into Christ. So the baptism in the Spirit is a perfectly acceptable scriptural term. It is found on the lips of Jesus. A second term that is used to describe the baptism in the Spirit, and there are a number of synonyms for his work, is simply this, the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. Luke 24, 49. Jesus says, again, 
in a sequence that follows Acts chapter 20, verse 22, where he'd already breathed upon them, saying, Receive the Spirit. Jesus states, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Jesus is telling believers who already have the Spirit of God living in them, don't you go out and do your work until the Spirit of God comes upon you. You're going to receive the promise of the Father. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus repeats this where he says to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now all of us know the importance of a promise. Any of us that have had kids know how promises come back to haunt us. And we ought to keep the promises we make. And the Lord has made us a promise that he is going to give us the Spirit. And indeed, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, tell us that that promise came to pass, that on the 120 at the day of Pentecost, indeed, the Spirit came upon them. In fact, he is described as being outpoured or even falling upon them. And Peter, in his sermon, Acts chapter 2, verse 33, when he describes what the promise is, said, Jesus exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. The important thing about Peter's statement is that he is saying the promise is something you see and hear. We have received the promise of the Father, which he says, you see and hear. That is the promise of the Father. The baptism in the Spirit is something that is both a visual, something you see, and audible, something you hear. And so we have to ask on the day of Pentecost what it is the crowd had seen that was both visible and audible, for if we can locate that, we know some of the entity of what the promise was. And what the crowd saw was a group of people who were praising the Lord in all the languages that were then spoken in the Near East, and they heard those people speaking those languages. In fact, Acts 2.4 says that they, this crowd of 120, were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Unfortunately, the New International Version weakens the strong Greek verb here and says simply that they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But the force of the original says as the Spirit gave them to utter. Utterance is a word that is a key to what the promise is. For what they were uttering, according to Acts 2.11 in other languages, was that they were declaring the wonders of God in tongues they had never learned. The wonders is a word which is megalos, meaning magnificent, splendor, grand, great, sublime, beautiful, mighty. And what they were doing in other languages that people saw them and heard them doing was talking about the magnificence, the splendor, the grandness, the greatness, the sublimity, the beauty, and the mighty deeds of God. They were describing how powerful and wonderful God is. The word utter itself means always when it is used in Scripture to speak out loudly and clearly, and there is an emphasis upon enthusiasm with it. Enthusiasm, by the way, means to be in God, and theos, in God, enthused. In the Old Testament, when the, Greek New, when the Greek Old Testament used this verb utter, it was used for prophetic speech. First Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. David, taking David together with the commanders of the army, set aside some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun for the ministry of utterance, accompanied by harps, lyres, and cymbals. I don't know if you've ever tried to talk with an accompaniment of harps, lyres, and cymbals, but I would suggest you would never get away with a stage whisper. And so, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1 tells us of those who had a ministry of utterance. The verb utter is used elsewhere in Acts. Acts 2.14, when Peter begins to speak to the crowd, the, new, the English version says that he spoke, but the Greek says he uttered to the crowd. The same word that is used in Acts 2.4 is used in Acts 2.14, and Peter, speaking to a crowd without a microphone, is declaring loudly and forcibly the claims of Jesus. Again, in Acts 26, 25, the verb utter occurs once more. And 
It does not mean reply, as the New International Version has it, but rather that Festus had interrupted Paul, and Paul responds to him in very clear articulation, in enthused speech. The promise of the Father, therefore, by looking carefully at the fact that it is something seen and heard, we assume, therefore, that the promise of the Father gave the disciples power to utter boldly how great God is, to praise Him unabashedly and unashamedly with no intimidation, no reserve, and no holding back, and after praising Him, to go out and utter strongly and powerfully as a witness. And probably the two weaknesses we all have as believers is that it is difficult for us to boldly and unashamedly praise God, and it is difficult as well for us to boldly and carefully and clearly set forth the claims of Jesus Christ in witnessing. The promise of the Father, therefore, is to come upon us that we might have this power of utterance which magnificently declares God's glory and greatness and at the same time comes with power in giving a witness to Him. Acts 2.17 says that Joel's words of the promise are being fulfilled. The promise of the Father was not a shove-off just to get the church started. For Peter says in Acts 2, 38 through 39 to the crowd, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. What is the promise for? Who is it for? Just for the 120, just for the day of Pentecost. The promise which the Lord gave, the promise which can be seen and heard, who is it for? For those that are far off. I can't think of anybody further off than 20th century Costa Mesites. Far off. It's for us. It's not limited to that day. It is for us. So the scriptural terms are first the baptism in the Spirit, then the promise of the Father. And we want to ask as we look at those terms, have you been baptized in the Spirit? Have you received the promise of the Father? The third term that is used in the book of Acts is a synonym as well. It means to, it simply says, to receive the gift of the Spirit. The baptism in the Spirit is referred to as a gift of the Spirit. And when so referred to in Acts, it is not referred to as a charism or a, the word charisma is not used, but instead the other Greek word dorea, which means simply a gift without payment, free gratis. We don't earn this. We don't work the spirit up. We don't find ourselves gradually conjuring up a spirit of ecstasy where we knock ourselves out in uh, spiritual therapy trying to get the spirit, but the spirit is a gift. Acts 2.38 Peter declares, you will receive the gift of the Spirit. He's talking about the same thing that they had just witnessed, the promise of the Father. In Acts 8.20, Simon Magus wanted to buy the gift of the Spirit of God with money. What he wanted to buy is that which the disciples in Samaria had received when the Holy Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. In Acts 10, verses 45 and 46, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Here's a very clear and explicit reference to the fact that the baptism in the Spirit is synonymous with receiving the gift of the Spirit. In Acts 11:17, so if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? The fourth terminology for the baptism in the Spirit is simply to receive the Spirit. First, the baptism in the Spirit, then the term promise of the Father, then receiving the gift of the Spirit, and then fourth, receiving the Spirit. Now here is where we need to be very clear on terminology because the verb to receive the Spirit can be used in more than one sense. It's obvious from John chapter 20, verse 22, that we all receive the Spirit in conversion. Therefore, when we open the book of Acts to Acts chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, and come to Samaria, we find believers that have already given faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of them have been healed. They are devout Christians by that time, but when Peter and John arrive, they pray with them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, 
Haven't they already received the Spirit in the sense of conversion life? Yes, they have. But now they pray, in fact, they'd even been baptized. But now they pray that they might receive the Spirit because the Spirit had not yet epipto or fallen come upon them, for they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands upon them and they received the Holy Spirit. Same thing again in Acts chapter 19, verse 2, where Paul coming to a band of small followers of John the Baptist, that is a small band of followers of John the Baptist, says to them in Acts 19, 2, having believed, did you receive the Spirit? That's the literal translation. Having believed, did you receive the Spirit? And it's possible that some translates that. When you received, did you, or when you believed, did you receive the Spirit? Or some translate it, since you believe, did you receive the Spirit? The problem with translation comes because you'll love this. There is an aorist participle and an aorist main verb. And the question that arises from a grammarian's point of view is, is the event of the main verb simultaneous or subsequent to the participle? Doesn't that grab you? That's what exegetes are for. That is, should we translate it since you received or when, or since you believed or when you believed? Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Or did you receive the Spirit since you believed? And there are some who say, obviously, Paul is saying, when you believed, did you receive the Spirit? Because every believer receives the Spirit at conversion. And the Pentecostals say, no, it means since you believed. Did you receive the Spirit? Because we received the Spirit after we believed. Well, fortunately, we have some guidance from the Scripture on this. An aorist participle and an aorist main verb happen in other places. With Judas, Matthew 27, 1, having delivered up guiltless blood, I sin. There, the absequent, the action is simultaneous. He delivered up innocent blood and he sinned. But Matthew 22, 25, having married a wife, he died. Aorist participle, aorist main verb. I would submit to you that the action is not identical, although some may think that that is the case. But marrying the wife came first, and then he died. Or Acts 5.10, having carried her out, they buried her. I would submit that having carried her out comes before burial. Therefore, when you have this phrase, having believed, did you receive the Spirit? At Samaria, the answer would have been no. Having believed, we did not receive the Spirit. But if you'd ask Cornelius' house, having believed, did you receive the Spirit? Since they received the Spirit simultaneously with conversion, their answer would be yes. So there's more than one way to look at that question. But in both cases, the experience of receiving the Spirit was an event subsequent or different from to conversion. Receive the Spirit. Pentecostals typically have gotten in trouble because in using that verb, sometimes they may carelessly infer to other believers that if you have not received the baptism in the Spirit, you have not received the Spirit. And that is not the case. The word is used precisely within Acts, and it's used to describe the baptism in the Spirit. John uses it precisely to describe conversion. Which leads us to the fifth term, and that is filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Acts 2.4, at the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit. Again, I note for you that this occurs subsequent to John 20.22. 20, and filled, by the way, is a past tense verb, which means that the point is fixed in time, that it happened. Now, this is not the only time, however, that the word filled with the Spirit is used in the book of Acts. Acts 4.31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That's different than Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And uh, it's different because in Acts chapter 4, the church for the first time was facing persecution. And they needed more of God than they'd ever received Him before. So those who had been filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 are described as again being filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 4 because we never take a view of the Holy Spirit that once having been baptized in the Spirit, we've got all that the Spirit has to offer. For there may be one baptism, but there are many fillings of the Spirit in our life. Acts 9, 17, Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands upon Paul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Spirit. He's talking to a man 
that has already been converted. When we speak of the filling of the Spirit as it is associated with the baptism in the Spirit, we err if we compare our filling to another person's. As an expert young kid, well-versed in uh, spotting hypocrites growing up on the pews of the church, I would listen to people talk about the baptism in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, and I'd sit there and say, if you're so filled with the Spirit, let's see somebody get healed tonight. And let's see you get out and be like Billy Graham. You know, if you're talking about being filled with the Spirit, let's get filled with the Spirit. And I've only come to realize as an adult that our filling is definitely dependent upon capacity and that people are at different levels of capacity. And what is a filling for me may be only a thimbleful for you because your capacities in being filled with all the fullness of God in terms of expressing giftednesses of the Spirit may be far greater than mine. They were all filled on the day of Pentecost, but only one person got up out of the 120 and preached a sermon and saw 3,000 people converted. The disciples were expansible and the gift of God was infinite. They were capable of receiving more of the Spirit and he was capable of giving more of himself. And when you come to the word filled with the Spirit later in Acts, you will always find it associated with crises. Stephen is full of the Spirit, Acts 6-3, when he is selected as a deacon, but he confronts those who are going to pelt him with rocks and put him to death. And when he looks at them, Acts 7.55 says he was full of the Spirit. When that term is used in Acts 7.55, does it mean that up to that time in his life he hadn't been filled with the Spirit? No, not that at all. He was filled with the Spirit when he was chosen as a deacon. He was filled with the Spirit when he was baptized in the Spirit. But never before had he faced a moment when he was going to lose his life. And that called forth a demand for a new energy from God. And so again, the Scripture says he was full of the Spirit. The same thing is used of Paul in Acts 13.9 where he meets the magician, Bar-Jesus, who tries to withstand his gospel witness, and Paul, full of the Spirit, looks at him and brings blindness upon him. Paul had never faced a situation like that before, and he needed the Spirit in a new measure. That's why I would suggest that from a scriptural point of view, the appropriate question is always not, did you receive the Spirit, but are you filled with the Spirit? because it is not sufficient to wear the baptism in the Spirit like some Boy Scout or Girl Scout badge to say, I got it. There are always new demands and new emergencies and new needs in our life, and I need God's Spirit today. In the New Testament, we are never, interestingly enough, told to know the Spirit. We are told to know Christ, but we are told to receive the Spirit, and in receiving, we experience Him. The baptism in the Spirit. Let me close with some analogies. There are some Bible events that are meant to be permanently memorialized when the people of God gather together. Passover has been such an observance. We have it carried over into communion. The Jewish people today still gather for the Seder, for the Passover. And when they gather together, they memorialize that the fact that Israel went out from Egypt and had a dinner on the night it left, and the lamb was sacrificed. Through that Passover, they are stepping back in time and identifying themselves as part of those people whom God called out of Egypt. When we take communion together, we are memorializing the Lord's death, and we are, as it were, stepping back into the room with Jesus and the original disciples and seeing ourselves sitting around that table with him. I would suggest that Pentecost is the same way, that through the baptism in the Spirit, we are going back with 120 to the day of Pentecost, and we are waiting for an endowment of God's Spirit. It's interesting that in the modern observance of Seder, the Haggadah, which is the instruction for the Seder, the Passover, notes that there are four different characters of sons, the wise, the wicked, the simple, and the one who has no capacity to inquire. And in regard to the wicked son, the Haggadah says, what says the wicked son? He asks, what mean you by this Seder? By the word you, it is clear he does not include himself, and thus has withdrawn himself from the community. It is therefore proper to retort upon him by saying, this was done because of what the Eternal did for me when I went forth from Egypt. For me, and not for him, for had he been there, he would not have been thought worthy to be redeemed. Therefore, what the Seder is saying, or what the Haggadah is saying, is that when the wicked son says you, he is saying, I was not there in the Passover.
but if he would say me, he would place himself in God's community. So Acts 2 is such a moment when we are meant to include ourselves in what the Spirit of God does. It's interesting that the baptism in the Spirit has a number of beautiful words to describe what the Spirit does for us. And the words are all associated with water. There are three of them. Acts 2.18 says that the Spirit of God is outpoured. In the last days I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And the idea of the pouring of the Spirit is that we get thoroughly soaked in the Spirit's presence. Acts 1.5 tells us that we will be baptized in the Spirit. And this means that we will be overwhelmed or immersed in the Spirit's presence. And I'm beginning to love the, to be able to ask myself the question, have you been and are you presently overwhelmed in the Spirit? So the word baptism in the Spirit sort of has an, uh, sometimes a very uh, tightly uh, typological meaning to us and we don't think of it freshly. But I want to ask in my own life, have I been overwhelmed in the Spirit? Am I soaked in the Spirit? Acts 2.4 uses another word associated with water, that we are filled with the Spirit. So on the one hand, when the Spirit is poured out upon us, it is the external coming of the Spirit upon us. When we are baptized in the Spirit, it is us in the Spirit. And when we are filled with the Spirit, it is the Spirit in us. And further, 1 Corinthians 12.13 says that we are all made to drink of the one Spirit. And John 7, 37 through 39 says that we will have, Jesus' words, the Spirit of God in a living way welling up within us, flowing out of us streams of living water. So the Spirit is described as that person in which we get soaked, that person in which we are overwhelmed, that person who fills us, that person from whom we drink, that one who flows out of us in our life. These terms speak of our experience in the Spirit and His experience in us. Is the term baptism in the Spirit a scriptural word? Yes, it is, used by the Lord. Is it meant to characterize our experience today? Yes, it is. What is its purpose? It is to initiate us deeper into the Spirit's mission and propel us into two areas of the Spirit's work. It's meant to draw us deeper in worship into God. That's the function of other tongues, which we'll look at more in detail next week. And the Spirit is designed to come upon us to thrust us into the world in the work of the Lord. Worship and work, those are the purposes of the Spirit. And we need the baptism in the Spirit because Jesus himself says, the work of the kingdom cannot be done without the baptism in the Spirit. All the things the Lord wants to do in the church and in the world cannot be done unless we are filled with the Spirit. Many things can be done without that, but the totality of what God wants to do will not be done. My Pentecostal experience has taught me that there is value into waiting in the Spirit's presence, that the Christian life is not simply intellectual. It is not simply theological. It is not simply mind-oriented. It reaches those deeper parts of us that relate to the mystery of the heart adoring God. The Spirit reaches into areas of our life where we know what God's will is but are not doing it. And the Spirit deeply forms the character of Christ in us as we allow Him. The Spirit wants to reach into the complacency of our Christian life where we would be satisfied to always live life as we are now living it. And what the Spirit wants to do is come upon us and make us earnest about the work of God. Really make us care that God's will and purposes be done in us to in effect shatter the idea of complacency and the idea that we're just going to live a normal life without ever giving ourselves in any significant or deep way to God. There are people in this service tonight that God is calling out of a life of spiritual complacency, out of a life of just sort of tripping along and calling you to surrender yourself in a deep fashion to God and hear from God like you've never heard from Him in your life. 
There are people in this service that are at the crossroads of life, making critical decisions in your life, and you need the Spirit of God as you have never needed Him in your life, and He wants to open up avenues of worship and avenues of vision to you that you would never have if you didn't open yourself completely to the Spirit and say, Oh, Spirit of God, I need you because I can never do this on my own. I can't live the Christian life on my own. I can't know what your will is on my own. I need your Spirit. And then give that any title you want to. But let's be open to God's Spirit and let's let the Spirit of God move over the form of our lives like He moved across the form of the deep in the creation and bring out of His working that creation of perfection and beauty which He desires. I want more of the Spirit and the Spirit wants more of me. Father, we thank you this evening for your spirit, a gift. How could it be, Lord, that we could find ourselves at times afraid of the gift of the spirit? When you, our Heavenly Father, give us good gifts, we want to receive in our heart of hearts all that you have for us, Holy Spirit. We thank you for coming to us and bringing us into the kingdom of God, bringing Jesus' life into us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that in addition you will place the Holy Spirit upon us. We need that, Lord. None of us are strong enough to be a powerful witness for you. None of us are strong enough this year to turn campuses upside down. None of us are strong enough to see a whole office floor one to the Lord. We need your spirit. None of us can last long times in prayer just simply saying words that we ought to say. We need the refreshing of the spirit to pray mightily and effectively and with intercession. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Don't just sprinkle it on us, Lord, but give it to us as a mighty downpour. Baptize us in the Spirit, Jesus. Fill us with the Spirit. Let us drink of the Spirit. Let the Spirit flow out of us as a living stream, well up within us. O oh, Spirit of God, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, Lord. Let's just now start.